everybody and welcome to the ZSL Wild Science Podcast. I'm Oni Boehm, Research Fellow here at the Zoological Society of London's Institute of Zoology. And today, everybody, we're going on an adventure to Madagascar. Now, Madagascar, of course, is the world's fourth largest island. When you think Madagascar, you probably picture a lush forested island paradise, but the reality is very different. The island has lost most of its natural forests, wetlands and grasslands and is in dire need of conservation and regeneration. In short, many of Madagascar's ecosystems have or are on the verge of collapse. Now, large animals, or megafauna, are key parts of ecosystems around the world because they distribute nutrients and seeds, engineer landscapes and so on. Yet they are disappearing from our planet at an alarming rate during the current extinction crisis. Now this is also true in Madagascar, where the large megafauna consisted of, no, not Marty the zebra, Alex the lion or Melman the giraffe. The large megafauna of Madagascar consisted of things like giant lemurs, elephant birds and even hippos. So Gloria the hippo should have felt relatively at home. So what impact has the loss of these large animals had on the island? What can we learn about Madagascar's past, present and future by exploring the diversity of these now extinct giant animals? And can we learn from these past extinctions on the island to help those species currently living there? So to make sense of Madagascar's megafauna, I have with me James Hansford. Now James is a research fellow here at the Institute of Zoology and although I am sure his knowledge of cartoon animals is nearly unparalleled, his knowledge on extinct megafauna is even greater. Thank you very much, Moni. ZSL's answer to Jurgen Klopp. You or me? You! you. <laughs> I don't manage anything, though. Oh, that's untrue. <laughs> but, I mean, we are winning. Winning. So, James, you did your PhD on those megafauna beasts, and I hear you particularly studied a true giant. So, my PhD research was trying to investigate the diversity and taxonomy of the world's largest birds, the elephant birds. So there's been a lot of confusion over the last few decades about how many species there were, how big they actually got, and what actual names we might need to call them based upon historical understanding of what their species names are. So I, I spent a lot of time measuring bones and trying to work out how many species there were, how big these birds were, and it turned out to be more diverse than we had anticipated. So there's about four species, three genera, which includes Mullerornis, Epionis, and Vurumbe. Varumbe means big bird in Malagasy, which is a new species or genus name that we came up with. You do know I now picture them like big and yellow, right? And kind of Sesame Street-esque. I'm not saying that was my plan, but it has turned out really well. (laughs) So, elephant birds, clearly big. How big? Oh, well, it depends which species you're looking at. I mean, the smaller ones, the Mullerornis, they're probably more like emu to ostrich-sized birds. Uh, tiny. Uh, tiny <laughs> birds. I mean, yeah, still among some of the biggest birds on the earth. But obviously, they got a bit bigger than that. So you had the Epionis hildebrandti, which uh, appears to be more of a wetland species from the Central Highland. Epionis maximus, which we thought was the extent and biggest size of elephant birds that there were. And there's Varumbe titan, which is the world's biggest bird ever. That one itself, which is what people really tend to want to hear about, most of them are around six to 700 kilos in size, which is truly enormous. But the biggest one that I measured, which was a femur, one of the femur bones, and we learn about the size and body mass from this by learning the circumference of that and putting it through an equation, that came out to be about 840 kilos in body mass, which is like the size of a cow or something. I mean, it's huge. That's enormous. So I like to kind of, you know, measure area in the size of whales, as we all do, right? Of course. Um, I suppose my go-to measurement for really large birds is the giant moa. So how does it stack up against the giant moa? Good question. So, you know, there's a bit of a tussle between moa and elephant birds and, and some other giant birds from Australia as well about who might be the biggest. So moa may actually top out uh, elephant birds as being the tallest. They seem to have slightly longer, more gracile legs. But elephant birds have really stocky, big legs. They're really thick. Hence elephant birds. Hence elephant birds. I think that's probably one of the key reasons for it. So we learn about mass from that. So whilst they might not have been quite as tall, they were probably significantly heavier. And it's quite hard to talk about height because it's about how the animals might have been posed, whether they had the bent legs all the time where we stretch it out, trying to reach the top of a tree or something. But we think about size generally through mass and therefore elephants, birds come out bigger. So have you ever contemplated coming up with extinct bird top trumps? Extinct bird top trumps. Uh, I would love that. Yes. I mean, I would buy it. I would play it. 
Uh, if anyone is listening to this and wants to make me elephant bird top trumps, please, please do. We're trying to figure out how Madagascar has changed because of the extinction of the megafauna like elephant birds. So what was their role in Madagascar's ecosystems, apart from years later entertaining you? <laughs> they played a fantastic role in entertaining me. So big animals have a disproportionate impact on the ecosystems they live within. They travel around a lot so they can able to disperse seeds that they consume and, and bring them to other parts of the island. So it aids in the transport of seeds and fruits in terms of how species can distribute against climate change. So if you find a plant that's living in an area and the climate has changed around it, it's difficult if it has big seeds and fruits for it to move around. Primates that live there still, the lemurs, might consume them, but then they drop them at the bottom of the tree, whereas an elephant bird may have swallowed those, moved it a large number of miles, and then deposited it somewhere else through its poo. And poo is really important because it, it's a part of nutrient cycling. So I would you... also assume it's been quite big if it comes out of an elephant bird. Well, that's a weird question, isn't it? Um, I once had an ostrich poo on me in a zoo in China. Uh, As one does. Through, through a fence, luckily, but uh, it... it <laughs> I don't know if it had a vendetta against me. I don't know. Sounds like but, it's a little bit of a contortionist as well. It pooed, through, <laughs> to you, like, pooed on you through a fence. It, That's amazing. It, well, it pushed through the, the fence somehow, the, the poo. It came out at a rate of knots. But that, that caused me to, a lot of pause for thought at that point because it made me think about the value of poo, particularly giant bird poo. And You think it's full of phosphorus, it's full of nitrogen, which are really important nutrients. And once you stop having large animals within an ecosystem, Perhaps you're shutting down that productivity, that nutrient pump from different areas that help produce seeds and fruits and allow plants to thrive. Let's see what other beasts were roaming around Madagascar in the past. What else was there big and impressive looking? Big and impressive looking? Well, there's not necessarily anything from the recent past that was quite as big as the biggest elephant bird. But there were some amazing creatures as well. If you go back into the fossil record, you've got things like dwarf hippopotami, giant tortoises, and, and a diverse array of incredibly different and large, medium and small bodied lemurs. I have done a lot of work on elephant birds, but it's really a good idea to seek someone who's been doing research on all of these species for a number of years. And conveniently, we have on the line Dr. Karen Sammons. Hi, Karen. So so what's been roaming around Madagascar? Tell us. Well, certainly the group that's got most attention, I think, other than the elephant birds, would be the giant lemurs. So one thing that we know, I mean, living lemurs in Madagascar, for sure, are some of the most famous. You know, when you ask anyone about Madagascar, they, if they know anything, they probably know about lemurs. But they may not know that, in fact, even, you know, a thousand years ago or some people think a couple hundred years ago, we had, you know, gorilla sized lemurs living in Madagascar. Um, some of these lemurs had squat little bodies, almost like koalas. Some of them were quadrupedal walking on the ground, but some of them were even suspending under branches like sloths. So they were doing incredible things. And some of these have been reconstructed up to about you know, 160 kilos. So these include some of the largest primates ever to have lived, certainly lived in Madagascar. A gorilla-sized lemur. Yeah, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? So we have really good evidence that some of these giant beasts were in Madagascar in the not so long past. In fact, there are even some accounts by some French explorers probably interacting with some of these animals and writing about seeing some giant things in the trees with, you know, faces like humans. Really fascinating to think how incredible it would have been to have seen one of these up close and personal. So when those gorilla-sized lemurs were around, so what would have Madagascar looked like then? Well, what's perhaps the most interesting thing that the subfossil record tells us, especially for lemurs, is that when we look at Madagascar today, we really have an east to west division. The west is what we call the dry part. We have a lot of the famous baobabs, the spiny desert. And then the east is the rainforest. So when you think of the lush, rich, high altitude and low altitude humid forest. And then the middle of the island today is completely deforested. And so the question has always been, was the island completely covered with forest? If so, what kind of forest was it? Was it little mosaic patches of forest or was it one giant continuous block? And there have been a lot of people debating about this because today we really don't have any glimpse about using the modern groups to understand what that area would have looked like. 
But when you look at the subfossil record, it gives you a really interesting glimpse because right in the middle of Madagascar, for example, not only do we find lemurs and we find lots of different species present, you know, hundreds of miles from any forest that we know today, but we see other groups. We see pygmy hippopotamus, tortoises, um, certainly giant, you know, medium and small bodied lemurs, crocodiles, all sorts of really interesting groups, many of which are no longer found today. So Karen, now all of these really interesting and super cool lemurs, elephant birds and hippos are are gone. What do you think would have been the cause of this extinction? Well, you know, there is evidence for a lot of these groups that the environment that they lived in, for example, these animals in the central high plateau, you know, these are clearly forest dwelling animals. They're highly adapted for living in the trees. And so it's really interesting to think you know, part of it may simply be that the environments that they once used were gone. But there's also other evidence that we know, for example, especially within lemurs, all the largest groups are gone. So it seems like not only were primates very hard hit in terms of which species were lost, but all the big ones are gone. And that's often a signature we get when animals are sort of selectively chosen to be either hunted or they may have slower life histories, so they have a harder time recovering from things like their populations being decimated. So larger beasts have a higher extinction risk. Absolutely. Yeah, higher extinction risk and also certainly harder time to rebound and also probably very appealing if you were going to hunt something, right? I mean, Why waste your time on something small if you can also get something much larger, which will feed you for a lot longer period of time. Like a gorilla-sized lemur. The one that hangs in the tree like a sloth would probably have been my choice. (laughs) I'm terribly ignorant here, probably, because I don't work in that field at all. But how can we learn about the past and about what contributed to these species extinctions from fossils or subfossils or bones or whatever it is you guys study? Sometimes, in fact, it's just as easy as looking at past distributions. There are some species of lemur that live in Madagascar today that have really restricted geographic ranges. And so by looking at the subfossil record, sometimes we see that, you know, wow, in the past they were widely distributed. They had much larger ranges. And so sometimes you can use that kind of information to help inform where you might want to see those populations expanding to in current times by understanding better the environments they lived in in the past. Now, some of those environments may no longer be around today, and that may be a big contributor to the reason they're not there. But it really helps you in making, you know, current conservation decisions to really understand vulnerability, understand differences in habitat, altitude and geography. It can be really valuable information. So James, when you looked at your elephant birds, how did you go about figuring out what happened to those? Well, there's still some debate going on about what actually caused the extinctions of elephant birds. Well, that's good. That keeps you in a job. So that's, It does that's keep good. me in a job. It's part of what I do. But um, I spent a lot of time looking at, at the bones, the leg bones. And just as Karen said, there's a lot of meat on the bones, and that's where you think you might actually want to start butchering these animals. Okay. So when I was measuring all these bones to try and work out what different species there were and how many species there were, how big, how small, what I started to notice was butchery marks, so tool marks that have been left on the bones. You tend to find these on the edge of the bones, right on the ends, where you might want to disarticulate the bones from each other and maybe some defleshing marks which is a wonderful word so <laughs> i feel like together with your phd qualification you also got a butchery qualification <laughs> maybe i don't know about that we have to speak to someone in a butcher shop when you look at these bones you start to see a pattern of where people have either killed or have found a carcass and then tried to take the flesh off of it and when you radiocarbon date these bones you can start to get an idea of when they were hunted And that's actually been quite a revealing part of my research. Probably leads to more questions than it actually answers. Again, it keeps you in a job. It's quite convenient. It keeps me in a job. So Karen, you've been working in Madagascar for a very long time. Why Madagascar? What's fascinated you about the place? Oh, Madagascar is just, it's such an amazing place. You know, if you were just to focus on the fact that its living animals are spectacular, you could spend your whole career just, you know, appreciating them. So Madagascar has some of, you know, arguably the weirdest animals and plants on the planet. 
but they have this high level of what we call endemism, right? So endemism meaning that these are animals that are found nowhere else on the planet. And the fact that you have such biodiversity hotspot in Madagascar makes it just for me really thrilling, really exciting to think about, you know, no matter where you go, you're bumping into something, something new or something that's unique to the island. But my original reason for coming to Madagascar actually related more to understanding how the modern animals got there. You know, you'd think that we would have a good grasp on this, but Madagascar Madagascar has been isolated for a very long time, almost 90 million years. And in fact, most of the groups that live there today, including these subfossil groups, these giant elephant birds and hippos, crocodilians and lemurs, we think those groups actually evolved after the island was separated, which is really bizarre, which makes you wonder how they got there, right? So did they cross mm -hmm. a huge oceanic barrier? They have to somehow get across the Mozambique Channel? Or were there other things at play? So I've spent a lot of time doing actual exploration within the time period of the Cenozoic to help us understand this. And part of that has included finding new subfossil sites and trying to push that record a little bit deeper. So Karen, when you look into the subfossil record, we look and describe lots of different species. Have there been any surprises in regards to what we see in the past and what we see alive today? One of, I think, the best stories of this discovery has to do with a lemur called the greater bamboo lemur. This animal is known as Prolemur simus, and it's actually currently one of the world's most critically endangered primates. What's interesting is that this bamboo lemur actually was once believed to be extinct. Uh, we knew from the subfossil record that it was widespread, uh, and it actually took until about 1986 when a remnant population was discovered. Um, and at the time, it was thought to be the only living population. But what's interesting is that by looking at the subfossil record and appreciating where it must have lived in the past, that actually helped lead people in certain directions to look into places it might live today and to see whether it's actually just a cryptic species that lives in a very specialized kind of bamboo forest. And so it was really interesting. That work led to these widespread surveys of South and Central Eastern Madagascar. And now we know that there are actually quite a few more individuals than we thought. And so it kind of shows you how looking at the past can not only help you appreciate the present, right, but it can also allow you to make plans for the future and look in a targeted way. So uh, if you can <laughs> find animals that were in the subfossil record but are actually alive today against what we might know, what do you think the chances are of there being a hippo, an elephant bird or a giant lemur left alive? Oh, I wish it was a big chance. I think it's probably a zero chance, but you know, there's always hope. I think a lot of people love the idea of that. And I can't lie and say that I haven't also thought of it quite often in some of these remote parts of Madagascar. I would argue that there's still a lot of Madagascar that is not well understood. I don't know. I challenge someone to go find one. I would love it. <laughs> it would really make my day. Money, you got a plane ticket ready? Uh, I was just about to say, Karen, what you can't see is James is currently packing his bag. He's, he's, he's off. <laughs> he's going to find that elephant bird. I think that there's always going to be some really interesting surprises. Part of it is that we can describe these bones, um, but sometimes we may just find bits and pieces. We don't necessarily find a whole skeleton. And so it was really interesting. The subfossil lemur I referred to before that is the specialist below branch, you know, hanger. For years, this animal was actually described as two different things. So it was thought to be a primate with a skull and strangely no associated bones below the skull. And then a giant subfossil sloth that lived in Madagascar with strangely no associated head. And it took a really <laughs> long time for people to realize these were part of the same animal. And so sometimes we piece together literally what's going on and it takes us a long time to really decipher the mystery. So it's always a work in progress. So it's essentially like one big puzzle jigsaw. Yeah, well, you're pulling that... lots of different bones out of the ground. You... Don't want to mix up a, a lemur with a hippo or an elephant bird with a tortoise. It gets a bit confusing if you start doing that. But just that sort of story of not being able to know what you're looking at because it's in one site or another, you know, that is the big jigsaw puzzle of, of paleontology. And how then does it come about that suddenly the penny drops and it's like, hang on, maybe that's the head of that guy? Yeah, that's a good question. Karen, what do you think? I mean, you spend a lot of time staring at bones, looking at bones, talking about bones. I do. You know, some of it is just getting enough experience staring at bones. I'm sure, James, you can relate. You, you're in a museum collection and you're staring at bones and they all look the same. 
And then after about 100 hours of staring at bones, you start seeing things that are slight differences or, or things that come out to you only after a lot of time and a lot of hard work. For me, too, one of the really interesting ways that my research has changed the last decade has been we have a lot more technology you know, at our fingertips now. We can do really interesting things, reconstructing environment, reconstructing diet with things like isotopes. We can also use other things that are not, say, vertebrate fossils. So one of my sites actually on the central high plateau, right in the middle of where we really don't know what's going on exactly. This is a region we think must have been forested, but now is completely devoid of any kind of forest cover. We actually find fossils of plants. So we find fossil wood, find fossil seeds. We can actually look at dendrochronology. We can look at tree rings. Um, and we can learn a lot about the kinds of trees that lived in this area in, you know, the not so distant past. We can date those seeds and figure out the timing when they were there. And what's interesting is we actually see seeds of trees that are, you know, hundreds of miles away now in the eastern rainforest. But clearly we're in that site, you know, not so long ago. So it's really interesting and it provides context for understanding all of the animals that lived there. Wow, that's really, really fascinating. I feel like I've gone into the wrong field of study. <laughs> it depends how muddy you want to get, Molly. I love mud. I really love mud. It's like one of my favourite things in the world. So today, Madagascar looks entirely different to what it looked like during the time of the elephant birds, right? We think that Madagascar may have looked roughly similar to what it does today in terms of eastern versus western, dry versus wet. But we know very well that even in the last 50 years, we've lost huge amounts of the eastern rainforest and the western forest. And so while we may not know the extent of that original sort of natural forest cover, we do know that we've already lost a lot. So probably we had a lot more trees. We must have also had extinctions among plant communities. And we, we actually don't have a very good understanding of that part of the puzzle right now. What would be your favorite Madagascar megafauna species? That's a good question. Well, I, I have to go with lemurs. You know, lemurs were what drew me to Madagascar in the first place. The whole idea of a giant gorilla-sized lemur, I found that to be so exhilarating and exciting that that was really what hooked me. That's the reason that I ended up deciding to pursue working in Madagascar, It's the reason that I chose the grad school I did. It's the reason that I chose the path I did, wanting to explore, wanting to help increase our understanding of the subfossil record. So yeah, I guess subfossil lemurs will always have a special place in my heart. <laughs> And um, one last question, Karen. What do you think does the future hold for Madagascar's amazing animals and plants? So that is actually a really hard question to answer. I think... You know, Madagascar is the kind of place you need a long-term vision, thinking about long-term goals. Because if you think in the short term, it can be pretty pretty hard to work in Madagascar. There's a lot of successes, but there's also been a lot of failures in conservation. And, and you really have to think outside the box a little bit with creative solutions and, and have a lot of hope. You know, I think I have a lot of optimism for Madagascar's future because I know that There are many people that passionately care about the animals that are left. But I also think that these are big challenges. You know, we need to really work hard with the forests that we have left, with the animals we have left. And if the subfossil record can help us talk to people who live in Madagascar about extinction and about what that means and what you lose and make a connection to what's left, then I think that's a great opportunity to really make it real for them. It's their own natural heritage. If Madagascar is going to succeed and, and move forward, then we really need everyone, not just people that are outside the country, but we need everyone, you know, to care and appreciate its natural heritage. A lot of that comes down to education and allowing people to appreciate and understand what they have in their own backyards. I like asking people about their favorite Madagascar megafauna species, but if I ask you, I think I know precisely what you're going to say, right? There's only one. It's definitely an elephant bird. I can't choose between them, and you wouldn't ask me to choose between them. Would you, Molly? I was about to, but... No! Fair. No. Um, <laughs> they're, so... all, they're all wonderful and beautiful. Just because they're not some of them aren't the biggest, they, they are all brilliant and wonderful in different ways. And learning about their different ecology and their different roles they played in Madagascar is going to be really interesting. Given the fact that they're a little bit like your children, what <laughs> happened to them? 
What caused the extinction of the elephant birds? <laughs> it's, it's hard to look into the past and determine exact causes of extinction when we don't have good historical records or good archaeological records or direct evidence. What we do have is a track record of butchery on elephant birds and other megafauna as well. And you can map those through radiocarbon dating and see when they started to stop hunting those animals and when they started hunting the smaller animals. And there seems to be a really interesting shift in how people subsided what animals they ate about a thousand years ago. So what we also see is we see a megafaunal crash about a thousand years ago. So we see these animals start to disappear. And this coincides with a large wave of human expansion. And we start to see lots more settlements and deforestation at this point as well. So it seems to be that whilst they may have persisted a long time alongside humans, that they started to decline when humans really started changing the landscape and exploiting them much, much more. If the science doesn't work out for you as a career path, Crime scene investigator. Well, I work with forensic experts to try and study this. I have a wonderful set of colleagues in the UK, based at Teesside University and over in the States as well, both independent experts in their field that have looked at these bones. They often actually work in law courts to determine if human agency has killed people and whatnot. Oh, I'm not the expert, but they are, um, and they've taught me a great deal. Helped you on CSI extinct megafauna. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to say cryptozoological detective, but I did. You, you, you so did. So when I was studying cut marks on bones, I was trying to understand the period of decline of elephant birds in particular, to try and understand if they had increased amounts of hunting towards the end of their extinction cycle. But what I did find was something I didn't expect to, which was tool marks on bones that were much older than people thought humans were even in Madagascar at all. So what I found was tool marks on bones that had been collected from a site called Ilakaka, or Christmas River, that had tool marks on bones that were about 10,500 years old. People have previously thought that humans had arrived somewhere between 2,500 to 4,000 years ago. So this pushed back the archaeological record back by about 6,000 years. And you casually did that in an afternoon's work? I arrived at a field centre in the Radamafan National Park, and they were in a display cabinet, and I spotted it. And then we realised we sort of accidentally changed history at that point. It was surprisingly casual at that point, but then we put it under intense scrutiny, taking it to my forensics experts to try and understand that if this was true, get it checked through additional radiocarbon dating to ensure that the date was actually perfectly accurate. Mm. And we had two radiocarbon dates and they matched really well, so we know it's really good dating. So James, extinctions continue in Madagascar, sadly, or at least a lot of species have crazy high risk of extinction. Are there any current stories of species extinctions or near extinctions? What are the species we should most worry about and what does that mean for ecosystems? Oh my gosh. Um, I've gone big. You've gone big. It's you. You called me Cynicel's answer to Jürgen Klopp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so go big, dream big and understand the whole big picture. I yes. like it. Okay. And when. And when. If only we had someone who is the head of some kind of knowledge of a, an international wildlife charity to help us out here. If only we had that. We now have on the line Dr. Richard Young from the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust, where he is, this is excellent, head of conservation knowledge. So who better to quiz about all things conservation in Madagascar, right? So Richard, tell us about the status of biodiversity and conservation in Madagascar. Wow, we're starting with a nice easy question then. Yeah, today the status of biodiversity in Madagascar is somewhat uncertain. Obviously, there's been centuries of biodiversity loss. It's a massive island and people haven't been there very long compared to lots of the parts of the world. However, really now there's only around about 12% forest cover left. And because of its unique history, it has obviously had lots and lots of species that are only found there in Madagascar. And as a result of that, are somewhat predisposed to extinction. So because of all, all of that change in forest cover and loss of wetlands and, and so forth, unfortunately, there are lots and lots of species that are very special, found only there, but are under significant threat, whether that's lemurs or water birds or chameleons or baobab trees. So it's in a bit of a perilous state, unfortunately. There's obviously been a huge international and national effort to try and conserve what's left. But we have to be realistic and accept the fact that just in the last two or three years, 
actually the rates of deforestation have spiked after a period of time where they were starting to come under control. So, yeah, we're worried, unfortunately, about the future of biodiversity in Madagascar. There's more to Madagascar than just forests though, isn't there, Richard? I mean, I know that the Durham Wildlife Conservation Trust have a lot of projects going on in, in wetland areas as well. And those wetland areas bring us some really interesting stories about bringing animals from the brink of extinction as well. So I was wondering if you might tell us a bit more about one of the most interesting projects you've got, which is around the Madagascar Potchard. Yeah, absolutely right. Perhaps a tropical forest in Madagascar steals the headlines somewhat. Madagascar is home to really special uh, wetland ecosystems, and particularly on the high plateau, which runs down the, the spine of the island. Right through that region, there are lots and lots of rivers and, of course, lakes, which were once home, we think, to unbelievable faunas, incredible diversity of waterfowl, things like pygmy hippos and incredible species that unfortunately aren't around any, any longer. And these, these wetlands are really important, of course, for this wildlife, but they're also really important for people. It's where lots of rural communities live and rice being the, the absolute staple of the Malagasy people, these wetlands are the best place to grow rice and also to fish. So these wetlands have been under pressure for many centuries through those reasons and others when we're, we're only just starting to understand. And as a result of that, these wetlands have been in massive decline and arguably one of the most degraded ecosystem types on the planet. These wetlands are just shadows, really, of their former selves with a number of species um, that are just about clinging on. And one a classic example of that is the Madagascar potchard, a diving duck unique to that island. And for a long period of time through the 90s, 1990s uh, and into 2000s, actually we believed it to be extinct. The last ever individual was seen unbelievably in a cardboard box that was brought from the lake in which we believed it was his last home down to a conservation organization's office in the capital Antananarive and handed over. And this bird lived out its last days in a, in a bathtub in the capital. And that tragically, we thought, was the last of its kind. And then remarkably in 2006, a team from the Peregrine Fund, they were doing surveys for another threatened bird, the Madagascar Harrier, quite remarkably saw a handful of these birds, uh, very distinctive looking birds, not the most colourful, you could argue, but the males have a really distinctive ivory coloured eye. And yeah, in the middle of this lake, we're swimming a handful of these birds and suddenly, boom, it was back from extinction. So we uh, caused some much celebration, but we quickly realised after doing the first assessments that probably there are only about 20 adult birds left. That was it. And all at one site, therefore in a really, really perilous state on the brink of extinction. So, so we've, we've had to act and we've had a long-term conservation programme ever since that day to try and bring it, bring it back from the brink. So what have been like the main obstacles in getting this species back from the brink and making sure that not more individuals turn up in cardboard boxes in some office? So obviously, just by virtue of its tiny population size, it's really vulnerable to sort of random events, disease hitting or a, a major mm. cyclone, which actually has just struck Madagascar just recently. So clearly, yeah, we were very concerned. So one of the, one of the main ecological problems that this bird faces is that they are living in a, a, what is an old volcanic crater lake. So it's really <laughs> deep sided. And this is a diving duck and therefore really only does well in shallow wetlands where they can dive to the bottom mm. and feed on benthic bottom living invertebrates. And in these lakes where they've just about hung on because they are so isolated, really, really, really isolated, right in the remote north of Madagascar, there simply isn't enough food. So both the lake themselves are very steeply sided, so the ducks struggle to actually find shallow parts that they can actually feed. But also we've, we've discovered that the abundance of invertebrates in that lake system is catastrophically low, just like in all other wetland systems in Madagascar. And we're not quite sure why. We think maybe the widespread use of some really nasty pesticides is, is one reason, but we're investigating that. So these 20 birds would nest on the, only on one of these lakes where there's a little bit of emergent vegetation and they would raise their ducklings. And these ducklings would basically fight for food and would try and die for food. And it quickly became apparent that essentially they were starving to death. So there might be a handful of clutches born every year, but only 2%, 3% sometimes of those ducklings would make it through to fledging so they could fly, at which point they could then visit the neighboring lakes, which had no nesting habitat, but actually a bit more food. So essentially, this duck is caught in an ecological trap. And that was the main ecological problem that we had to face. Mm. So, yeah. And then, of course, being Madagascar, being in a very remote part of the world, there are a huge number of practical logistical problems, whether it's just getting around the state of the roads. Once we realised how endangered this species was, 
and you know restrict to a single site clearly a captive breeding effort was going to be required to produce animals for a future release in a restored wetland elsewhere that much more suitable to the, the life history of the bird so we set up a, a breeding program you know potchards are relatively straightforward to breed in captivity that was really good the breeding facility at one point we had to move all the birds away to um, a completely different location because of banditry there was a, a period of insecurity where bandits were raiding the town we were based so we had for safety reasons had to move people and, and the birds themselves so that was a bit, a bit of a problem and of course you have to navigate the politics of madagascar which our team do very well so yeah i mean um, it, you know the, the breeding's gone really well getting hold of the right food at the right time can be a bit problematic but essentially you know we knew we were really confident in how that we could breed this animal the big problem was where could we release them to? So we conducted a, a huge nationwide survey of all those plateau wetlands to try and find essentially the least worst. That's what it proved to be, um, <laughs> where there was perhaps some emergent vegetation for nesting, that it was a shallow lake system, that there's still some benthic invertebrates left. And we, we have found somewhere which is now subject to a long term ecological restoration program, as well as working with the local communities on uh, issues like sustainable fisheries, more effective, uh, productive rice cultivation, and, and lots of aspects of food security and wider rural development with them. So we have the wetland that's under restoration. We've had some pretty exciting news just recently in terms of this pop chart being released back into the wild. Oh, wow. That's That sounds like one of the most amazing roller coaster rides. Oh, no, it's extinct. Oh, no, they're still there. Oh, the lake is rubbish. They, they can't find enough food. Oh, no, they're breeding well. Oh, where to put them? It's a very a lot of ups and downs. That sounds It's a, it's a phenomenal insane. story of yeah. bringing these birds back from the real brink of extinction, yeah, and even gets... beyond extinction. Sorry, yeah, roller coaster is a good description, actually. It's just, it's, it's to date been a 14 year roller coaster ride. <laughs> So yeah, it requires, it requires a lot of a huge effort, determination, clearly, and a lot of resilience. The problems are every day, and you have to be really determined to be able to fix them and, and move forward. But it's working. It's working, <laughs> albeit slightly with those ups and downs that you talked about. So 14 years to bring it back from the very complete brink of extinction to a population that's starting to regenerate itself and, and live in a, a stable environment. So what does the next few years, next 14 years hold for the future of the Madagascar potchard? What's around the corner on the roller coaster ride? <laughs> <laughs> well, not that we're blindfolded on this roller coaster, of course. We have got our eyes open, but looking around the corner in Madagascar in the current political environment can be challenging, certainly. But I'd like to share some really good news with you. Um, so in 2018, <laughs> we considered the lake that we're, which we're restoring to be in sufficiently good shape that we could actually release captively bred Madagascar potchards onto it, which we did. They've, they've survived in pretty decent numbers. We've had obviously some animals move to neighbouring wetlands, some die from natural causes, but a really, you know, an acceptable number have survived. And they're, they're using the lake quite happily and the local communities are really happy with the, with the pro program so far. So that was all really good. But these were quite young birds. It was very young birds that were released. And then just around Christmas time, actually, we heard news from the field team that these birds, now mature, have actually bred. And so just a few weeks ago, we got the first images of 12 wild-born ducklings swimming around the lake. And it was, yeah, seeing these, seeing these photographs, absolutely amazing and huge, you know, reason for celebrating this uh, a success, which you have to do in these, in these, these long-term roller coaster like programmes. So the team out there have done an amazing job. So, yeah, these little wild-born ducklings represent a huge amount of hope. So we have our first wild-born generation, uh, and the next few years will be a very close monitoring, further releases of captive bred birds, and working hand in hand uh, with the local communities that live around the, the lake. So that to really work with them on the issues that they face um, every day when it comes to trying to secure enough food for their family, clean water, uh, medicines, education, and these sorts of things. So there's a lot of work to, to be done, working with those communities, the slow but sure restoration of the wetland, and to make sure the Madagascar potchard there is thriving and perhaps even starting to colonise nearby lakes. So we're, we're really hopeful. We've got a, a long term action plan, which takes us up until the end of 2025. So we're really clear on what needs to be done between now and then. And then, of course, we'll be reviewing successes and, think, and lessons learned you know, up and just before that point, And then again, setting another five to 10 year plan. So, yeah, we're, we're really quietly pleased about it. And the sight of these ducklings floating across the lake has filled us with joy, basically, and a lot of hope for the future. 
That's amazing news. That's amazing news, Richard. And that must have been one of the best Christmas presents ever, surely. <laughs> Absolutely. 14 years in the making Christmas present. Yeah, it was lovely. A colleague of mine has this mantra, it takes decades to save species and centuries to restore ecosystems. Mm-hmm. And he's probably right. It really does. You know, when you're working as an organisation and a team of people and as individuals on these programmes for years, if not decades, then these little successes along the way are really important to celebrate. And so, yes, we, we definitely raised a glass or two for those little ducklings. Good and deservedly so. And I think it's not even just a little success. That sounds like a major step. It's huge. And I think it's a fantastic project and a great undertaking. Congratulations. A job well done. Um, we may have to go on a bit of a roller coaster journey again with the next question, though. What do you think the future holds for Madagascar species? Are there reasons to stay positive? Are there silver linings? Is it just very depressing? Or does it depend on the mood that one is in on the day? Take your pick. That's a tough question. Well, thankfully, I got up early and had an amazing walk with my dog under bright blue sunshine hearing skylarks singing, so I feel quite hopeful today. But I suppose that somewhat answers your question in as much as you know, some days are really tough and you, you look at all the challenges and hurdles that need to be overcome and some of the, the problems in a country like Madagascar and, you know, particularly the rural communities and the challenges they face. So it can be really difficult to see a positive future. But hope and a belief is really, is you know, two powerful weapons, basically. And um, that's the reason why we do celebrate these successes, because it can refuel hope and it can refuel belief. And, you know, yes, there are a lot of, a lot of problems loss of forests or degradation of wetlands, bleaching of coral reefs or whatever it is in a place like Madagascar. But there are successes. So it's a real careful balancing out both in terms of the way you talk about it, but also the way that you think about it. You know, you have to recognise the enormity of the challenge ahead, but equally look at those successes and use that, you know, to empower you, but not just talk about successes because that would be, be misleading because the, the challenges are, are so great. In the short term, until the political social problems are resolved in countries like Madagascar, then often a conservation success is, in reality, making things less worse than they would have otherwise been. And we have to kind of accept that. The really nice thing about the Madagascar pot chart is it's a very it's very clear progress. It's recovery. We're not naive. We realise it could be setbacks, but it, it is clear, demonstrable recovery. And that's a really positive thing. I'm feeling quite optimistic today. So I believe absolutely we have to fight for the future of Madagascar's wildlife um, and work, work hard towards it. Nice and hopeful. I like it. I yeah, yeah, no, I, I liked it. It was like a verbal hug. So when we look into the recent past of Madagascar and we find lots of bones in wetland environments, things that have lived alongside the Madagascar potchard. We find lots of megafauna. So I always wanted to know what of those species would you like to have seen in the flesh and why do you find it so interesting? Hmm, That's a great question. I guess the kind of somewhat obvious answer would be to see one of the elephant bird species because there's nothing like it really. So that would be pretty remarkable. And my my imagination certainly was captured when I first saw David Attenborough holding an elephant bird egg on TV. And I just thought that was phenomenal. So that kind of would be the obvious answer, I suppose. But after spending a lot of time in the wetlands of Madagascar, I would love to have seen the pygmy hippos. I would love to have seen huge herds of pygmy hippos in some of those wetlands, kind of just doing what they would do best and kind of engineering that environment. I think that would be and bringing, bringing those wetlands back to life, I think that would be absolutely wonderful. Great answer. I mean, hippos provide so much productivity to an environment like a wetland, so I can only agree with you on that. But... Yeah, and in, in all honesty, also, you mentioned the elephant bird. You should have seen James's face. <laughs> I mean, joy doesn't even describe it. So, James, I learned a lot about Madagascar today, that it's more than just a movie franchise. But what's next for you? What's next for me? Is it more big extinct birds? There's always more big extinct birds on my horizon. Down in the bone storage room, which we have here at ZSL, we have a very interesting collection of elephant bird skulls, which is the biggest collection in the world, and we're hoping to start conducting research on those soon. We are looking to understand more about the diversity, their role in ecosystems, and try and understand what we've lost in Madagascar. These are big questions that if we want to restore ecosystems, we have to understand what we've lost so we can move forward and get back to somewhere productive and stable. That sounds amazing. Already I want to ask, how big is an elephant bird skull? But we'll probably leave that for another podcast. Let's leave that for another podcast. Leave that for another podcast. (laughs) 
How big was that poo that landed on your shoe? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it was. It was. Uh, size is difficult. It was quite squirty. I didn't collect a volume size from it. I'm afraid, Monty. It's an opportunity missed. I, an opportunity I feel missed. maybe we could go out into one of Zelda's lovely zoos and collect such samples one day. You and I. Yeah. Absolutely. This will be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> Zedazel's answer to Jürgen Klopp, I should really put this on my business card. <laughs> <laughs>